Good morning. I apologize for uh, running a few minutes late, and then I'll call this hearing to order. Uh, last year, the subcommittee held a hearing examining the small business labor market. At that hearing, we heard that job vacancies across America are at an all-time high. We also heard that there are millions of Americans sitting on the sidelines not looking for work, and that undue regulations can cost the American economy almost $2 trillion every year. With this in mind, the subcommittee is here today to examine a particular set of regulations that may increase prices for consumers, increase job vacancies, and hurt small businesses, occupational licensing. In its simplest definition, occupational licensing requires a business or an individual to request permission from the government to practice certain occupations. The percentage of the workforce that requires an occupational license has increased from less than 5% in the 1950s to almost 33% today. Although some occupations can be dangerous and need specialized education, research shows that the amount of training required for a license almost never matches the risk of an occupation. There are also significant inconsistencies between state requirements for licensing. For example, while an individual in Missouri must only pay a $52 fee and does not need specialized training to be an auctioneer, Tennessee requires a $650 fee and 756 days of specialized training for the same license. But one of the most telling statistics about licensing is that while there are 1,100 occupations in the United States that are licensed in at least one state, only 60 require a license in all 50 states. This inconsistency hurts workers' mobility and, most importantly, small business. This morning, we will hear from a distinguished panel about how the federal government can help provide solutions to reduce licensing barriers on small businesses. I thank you all for being here this morning, and I yield to the ranking member for his opening remarks. Dwight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this here. Licensing is a process by which the state requires a worker to meet basic standards at the local, state, and federal level before they're able to perform the job. While the origin of this limits has noble goals of protecting the safety and well-being of residents, we can think of instances where the requirements have proved burdensome and bear little resemblance of the function they were intended. It makes sense to license election EMTs, daycare workers. The harm does not by an unskilled person working in one of these professions and, and much more serious than a hairdresser and travel guide. Nonetheless, occupation licensing persists and has become ever more burdensome across the nation. Since the 1950s, the number of licensed workers has jumped from just 5% of the workforce to nearly 30% today. That's nearly one in four workers. Yet not every occupation is regulated consistently across states. Fewer than 60 occupations are regulated in all 50 states, showing a substantial difference in which occupation states choose to regulate. Making the situation worse for workers, many of whom are thriving to be small business owners, are the fees required, the training costs, and time spent studying and testing. While the requirements serve a functional purpose, they are also a barrier for entrepreneurs to enter an occupation, especially for low-income and immigration workers. Today's hearing will give us the opportunity to learn more about the genesis of professional licensing and its evolution. Though this issue is primarily one for the states to take up, it's nonetheless important for us to bring it up to the forefront because it has an effect and can help guide policymakers at the federal level. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Evans. If committee members have an opening statement prepared, I ask they be submitted for the record. I'd like to take a moment to explain the timing lights for you. You will each have five minutes to deliver your testimony. The light will start out as green. When you have one minute remaining, the light will turn yellow. Finally, at the end of your five minutes, it will turn red. I ask that you try to adhere to that time limit as best you can. And with that, we'll go to introductions. Our first witness this morning is Jarrett Dieterle, Senior Fellow at the R Street Institute here in Washington. He also serves as the Institute's Director of Commercial Freedom Policy, focusing on regulatory affairs, occupational licensing, and other commercial freedom issues. Thank you very much for coming to testify with us today. Thank you. And you may proceed. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Bratt, uh, Ranking Member Evans, and uh, the subcommittee uh, for inviting me to testify today. Um, as uh, the subcommittee may know and was just mentioned, uh, I direct the R Street Institute's work on commercial freedom policy, including our study of occupational licensing. Uh, 
Uh, in many ways, occupational licensing has become one of the major labor policy issues facing today's workforce. Uh, as mentioned, it's currently estimated that one out of four Americans needs a government license to work, and the average license requires almost a year of educational training, passing an exam, and paying over $250 in fees. The human cost of excessive licensing is uh, easy to overlook, but consider the story of Sandy Meadows, uh, a widow from Louisiana, who began arranging flowers, the main skill she knew after her husband's death. Louisiana stopped her by denying her a floristry license, and according to her attorney, she ultimately died alone and in poverty, unable to support herself. Licensure acts as a barrier to entry for low and middle income Americans seeking to enter new professions. It is these populations that are least able to overcome the high fees and the burdensome educational requirements that many licenses mandate. Licensing can also hurt entrepreneurs and small businesses trying to enter new markets, all the while protecting incumbent businesses from competition. While licensing requirements are often enacted in the name of health and safety, they can only rarely be justified on those grounds. The sheer variance in licensing standards shows this. For example, in states where interior designers are licensed, the designers are required to complete six years of training, whereas the national average for emergency medical technicians is a mere 34 days. The empirical research available has also notably failed to demonstrate a clear connection between more stringent licensing and better safety outcomes. Importantly, in fields where health and safety concerns are legitimate, there are often less burdensome alternatives to licensing that can still ensure safety. Options like inspections or bonding, third-party rating systems. In recent years, there has been growing bipartisan recognition of occupational licensing, but there is yet to be a broad systemic repeal of licensing laws across the country. While most licensing, as mentioned, takes place at the subnational level, the federal government can still play a role. Today, I'll focus on just a few options. First, Congress has several legislative options that would materially reform occupational licensing. One is the Alternatives to Licensing that Lower Obstacles to Work Act, the Allow Act, which was introduced by Chairman Bratt and Representative Beddoes in the 114th Congress. The Allow Act would utilize Congress's constitutional authority over the District of Columbia to establish a template for occupational licensing reform that other states could follow. It would also tackle the problem of military spouse licensure by allowing military spouses who work at federal military inst installations to be exempt from state licensing requirements. Another option is the Restoring Board Immunity Act, which draws upon recent Supreme Court precedent by offering states a safe harbor from federal antitrust law in exchange for reforms to their licensing boards. In addition to these bills, licensing and federal government agencies and contracting should be reviewed. The federal government workforce and contractors together make up over 5% of our country's workforce, and the federal government controls the licensing requirements for those positions. Congress could order a review, for example, of licensing requirements across federal agencies and contracts, identify ones to eliminate. And finally, the Federal Trade Commission's licensing work could be expanded. The FTC is empowered with research and advocacy powers under federal law, which it has used to file advocacy comments and establish its Economic Liberty Task Force, which focuses on licensing. Congress could enhance the FTC's licensing work by passing a specific line item appropriation that directs more money to the agency's efforts, or it could simply direct the FTC to spend more of its existing budget on occupational licensing work. Hopefully this testimony has successfully highlighted the issue of excessive licensure and given Congress and the subcommittee some options to consider. I thank the subcommittee for inviting me to testify here today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions today or in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dealey. Our next witness is Keith Hall, President and CEO of the National Association for the Self-Employed. He's a certified public accountant and has provided consulting and tax services to small businesses for over 20 years. Thank you for testifying this morning, and you may begin. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Bratt, Ranking Member Evans, thanks again for the chance to be here to represent small business. Uh, more specifically, I'm here to represent over 30 million self-employed and micro-business owners, big part of our economy. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but over 70% of all new jobs, half of all the employees in this country, 99% of all businesses are small businesses. I see it as my job to help those small businesses be more successful. And I think that's the goal of this committee as well. Uh, I also believe that the primary asset all those small businesses have is their time. Now, throughout the long debate over tax um, reform, we only ask for two things. We ask that the proposals be simple and that they be fair. And as we talk about occupational licensing, I think those are the same two parameters to focus on, simple and fair.
and anticipating this meeting today, we surveyed our members and we found that 68% of our members say that they are in, in, encumbered in their success because of occupational licensing. Uh, that's a big number. Now we've each referred to the license to work um, issued by the um, Institute of Justice that noted the dramatic increase in the number of licenses that there are today, and I think that's very important. But to me, the scary part is how many Americans out there chose not to go into a new profession or chose not to start a new business just because of the licensing. And that's something we can't validate by a survey. That's really scary. Uh, I think the concerns of our members are threefold. One, the cost of licensing, both money and time. Two, the inconsistency of licensing requirements from state to state and city to city. And then three, the impact of those two on low income and less advantaged members of our community. I think those are, are very important. Uh, I think the first and most important step is increasing awareness and support, making this known. Uh, the fact that we're here today talking about this is, is a great first step. Uh, we strongly support the efforts of the FTC uh, and what they are working on through the Economic Liberty Task Force. Uh, they've honed in on a number of specific occupations to promote uniformity and reciprocity state to state. I think encouraging that states providing uniformity in licensing, allowing the transition of workers from state to state is very critical. I think that's particularly important to our veterans and their spouses, as Mr. Deedley kind of referred to. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I'm here representing 30 million micro business owners. That number is expected to be 50 million by 2025. To put that in perspective, that's roughly one third of all the tax returns filed in this country will have a Schedule C attached to it as part of the income for those families. Uh, one of the reasons for that growth is growth in technology. Uh, as technology has made the world smaller, uh, small business owners find themselves expanding their community, not just in their locality, but throughout the state, in many cases multiple states, and even throughout the world. I think it's inevitable that that trend is going to continue. Expanding that nature of our communities shouldn't be something that is restricted by occupational licensing. Now, I hate um, pointing out issues without offering some solutions, so I think there's three things that we should focus on. One, uh, we can support and amplify the FTC's Economic Liberty Task Force. I think that's through unique funding opportunities. I think that's a critical first step. Two, uh, formally encourage trade associations and other organizations to review their licensing based on removing the barrier to entry. Uh, and then third, find some way to support scholarship programs through associations uh, that can provide some financial assistance for some of those entries, particularly to the more disadvantaged Americans that we have. Uh, now, I'm not here to ask Congress to enact a new law eliminating licensing, because obviously licensing is, is still important. We want to make sure that the professionals we rely on uh, provide quality services to us. But I am asking that we as a committee, we as association leaders, use our influence to make sure that this issue is evaluated based on what it is, which is a barrier to economic growth. I think a vast majority of small businesses only want two things, and that is it to be simple and for it to be fair. And if we can figure out a way to do that, as always, small business owners will take care of the rest. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and thanks for holding the hearing today. All right. Thank you both very much. Uh, Mr. Zoni, you got the hint here. They all have three solutions, so we're looking forward to your three <laughs> solutions. Our third witness is <clears throat> Frank Zona, owner of Zona Salons, which has three locations in the Boston metro area. Mr. Zona is the third generation of his family to run the business, which originally started in Sicily and later moved to the United States. He will be testifying this morning on behalf of the Professional Beauty Association, where Mr. Zona also sits on their Government Affairs Board. Uh, thank you very much for being here today, and we look forward to your testimony. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairman Brad and uh, Ranking Member Evans and, uh, and subcommittee members. Um, I'm not sure if my family was actually licensed in Sicily. I should just get that on the record right away. Um, I want to uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity to participate in this hearing uh, regarding excessive occupational licensing on small business uh, 
Uh, thanks for the work you do as a committee. It, uh, as a small business owner, it really matters to me. I really do look at it as a resource and appreciate it. Um, I also appreciate uh, my fellow witnesses here because uh, I'm still learning myself sometimes about the environment I do business in, and uh, I appreciate their work. I'm here first and foremost representing myself, a small business owner from Massachusetts. Uh, it is a third generation salon business, and uh, I employ about 75 people um, in those three locations. We're stuck at 75. I've been stuck at 75 for about three years, in part due to licensing, uh, which I'll explain as I go along. Inside the industry, I, I am active uh, in it, in the Professional Beauty Association. I appreciate those uh, comments about the role of associations, because I do think that's part of it. Um, you know, PBA is a, non, a national nonprofit representing all segments of the industry. So that would be salons like myself, uh, spas, uh, barbershops, the individual professional, manufacturers and distributors, um, and, and licensed professionals. Uh, the diversity of membership made it a little difficult for me to even prepare my testimony today because that's a lot of different points of view. Um, so I think the, 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 the view of a for-profit school owner um, who is preparing people for their licensing exam is different than my point of view, uh, possibly. And the uh, manufacturer and distributor of uh, products that are distributing through the professional channel have probably never sat on a licensing board. Uh, I have. Um, so I'm going to approach this uh, from my own point of view. In the past, I've testified to House Ways and Means on uh, tip income reporting. I've served on the Massachusetts Task Force for the Underground Economy and, uh, and the Board of Cosmetology. And I'm happy to share my experience uh, in that. Um, and then outside the industry, I'm a board member of Work, Inc., a leader in the field of providing work opportunities for people with uh, disabilities. So in all my roles, I've really been focused on how to get people in, not keep them out. Um, uh, since I'm uh, testifying for myself, I'll describe my business. It's really services, right? Um, our revenues derived from services and retail 90-10 split. That's pretty typical in the industry. Retail, of course, has been affected by e-commerce. Where I'm less unusual in my own industry is that I employ my workers, and I represent really only about 13% remaining of my industry that employs uh, uh, workers. M the great majority now are classified as uh, self-employed. I see that really as a challenge, both on the licensing side and just the competitive side, and, and it, I don't know what all the implications are, but, but it's significant to, to know that uh, fact. Uh, it does create a different uh, landscape and a lot of movement in the industry, and that movement has implication of labor, taxes, and licensure. Um, in my business, we are offering what we should, health insurance, disability, retirement, training and development. We're even now looking at student loan assistance, but uh, the truth is, is that 65 cents of every dollar is currently going to cost of labor, and I'm trying to figure out how do I fit it all in. Um, none of this changes the fact that if I want to grow Zona, I've got to grow headcount. And as this, members of this committee well know, headcount is hard for all businesses in a 4% unemployment environment. Now take that 4% and let's slice it up and say, of that 4%, who holds a license in cosmetology and wants to work in an employment situation? So low unemployment, worker classification, high turnover. Here's another problem. There's only one way into my industry, um, and that is through a program that is going to lead to licensure. In Massachusetts, that's the lowest uh, standard of hours that there are in the country. Massachusetts and New York are 1,000 hours. That still, for practical purposes, means the better part of a year uh, for someone to go to cosmetology school and somewhere in the band of twelve to $22,000. Um, uh, so that's a, that's a big uh, issue. Since our business model is upper mid-market, we still have preparation to do. We still have training to do because the license provides a necessary, important, I believe, level of standards, um, but we're not done there. Um, and our, our entry level, level duties is really a focus of mine when it comes to getting people in. Um, because there's a fair amount of attrition from the industry, right? There might be someone who goes to beauty school and then once they're in the actual job, they develop a skin condition. Um, and they're out of the business in a short order of time because they were never really exposed to that in the training. But they still have the $20,000 student loan. Right? So how do you get people in at the front end to try an industry um, so that you have less problems with student loans, with uh, a variety of things? Um, so those duties, shampooing hair, blow drying hair, uh, that they could give people a chance to enter partially in um, uh, before committing that kind of uh, resources. Um, I can't fill these entry level jobs right now. There's no licensing mechanism to do that. Someone's got to do the whole deal to find out if they want to try it. 
Um, as you know, for-profit education is being scrutinized, further regulator, regulated on both the federal and state uh, levels. Putting the politics of for-profit aside, there's 30 percent fewer schools today uh, than there were just a few years ago. In my own state, there's 10 fewer. So not only is school difficult, there's few of them, so there just aren't the graduates. I personally attempted to uh, purchase a school, and when I looked at the, the environment, and I was like, no, thanks, I'll, I'll stick with cutting hair. Um, but it leaves uh, salon employers almost entirely dependent. So what do we do about it? I'm not prepared to say licensing should go away. I need the foundation, I need the commitment. But I do think employers, like myself, should be designed in, particularly at the entry level, creating reforms where appropriate. I believe we do need boards with industry participants with the right controls. Uh, I do not think the federal government should be completely dictating to the state, but there's legitimacy to the conversation and to the federal government's economic freedom and competitive concerns. I do think we need to move past just the public safety argument to recognize that licensing also impacts public welfare. Uh, the beauty industry is a people business, and the labor intensiveness triggers not only safety concerns, but also public interest concerns. Um, I think licensing does present a barrier, but there's a lot of barriers, and it's not necessarily an absolute barrier. If it was unregulated, I'm not sure how I feel about it, uh, because in an unregulated environment, I think entry, entry into an occupation is not barrier-free. Uh, movement is not barrier-free. Workplace barriers, informational barriers, cultural barriers, discriminatory barriers. Uh, I'd be happy to talk about the nail salon uh, issue in uh, New York, where it was licensing that helped find some exploitation there. Um, but I, I definitely believe that occupational licensing can and should be uh, looked at for some opportunities of reform and can be a tool to get people in, not get keep them out. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Mr. Zona. <coughs> I now yield to our ranking member for the introduction of the next witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kleiner, a professor at, at Hubert School, Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the Center of Human Resources and Labor Studies. Both at the University of Minnesota Twin City, he is also a research associate in labor studies with the National Bureau of Economic Research and serves as a visiting scholar in economic research department of the Federal Reserve of Minneapolis. He has published extensively in the top academic publications on the topic including three books, Organization, Occupation Regulation. Mr. Kleiner has also testified internationally and domestically on occupation re regulation and provided guidance to a variety of agencies, including the FTC, the Treasury, DOJ, and name just a few. He received his doctorate in economics from the University of Illinois. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Bratt and Ranking Member uh, Evans and the other members of the uh, subcommittee. Uh, as let me start with with my conclusions and, and as echoed in an article that appeared last week in the Economist magazine uh, because it is it establishes that wage and other benefits of occupational licensing are concentrated primarily among the individuals who are already well paid evidence indicates that occupational licensing can hamper mobility making it harder for workers to take advantage of job opportunities in other, reason, in other regions. There is relatively little evidence to show that occupational licensing has actually improved the quality of delivered services in many fields, although it has been shown to increase prices and limit economic output. A government should require cost-benefit analysis prior to new licensing rules, allow practitioners to cross borders without economic penalties and reduce regulations in certain occupations. Uh, first, occupational licensing makes it more difficult to enter an occupation and move across political jurisdictions. While licensing may be an effective means of boosting wages for some occupations, licensed workers are not always better off. Empirical evidence indicates that licensing can hamper mobility, making it harder for workers to secure jobs in other states. Occupational licensing can thus serve as a deterrent to geographic movement in several ways. For instance, licensing is typically administered at the state level, and workers ha may have to repeat many of the requirements and investments necessary 
to gain licensure when moving across state borders. In some partially licensed occupations, for example, interior design, if you're moving from an unlicensed state to a licensing state, you must go through the full set of requirements in order to get a license. Uh, another issue is that relicensing requirements can be prohibitive in terms of both time and money, thereby discouraging workers from moving to other licensing jurisdictions where greater opportunities often exist. Beyond its detrimental effect on workers, this lack of mobility can harm consumers, especially in rapidly growing areas. To the extent that licensing slows the influx of new workers, and inhibits greater competition, consumers are unable to access services at the lowest cost. Small businesses are not as likely to hire uh, workers at existing wages, creating what they perceive as shortages. Second, licensing can, can affect consumer prices via several channels, from restrictions on worker mobility to limits on advertising and commercial practices. The impact of licensing on wages ranges somewhere between 5 to 33 percent, depending on the type of occupational practice and location. Third, occupational licensing reduces the ability of individuals to enter regulated occupations. For example, occupational licensing can reduce labor supply by between 17 to 27 percent. Men responding to occupational licensing with larger restrictions in labor supply than women. Longitudinal data show that the longer an occupation is licensed, the greater the ability to limit entry and raise wages for its workers. In addition, immigrants have lower levels of licensing than natives, suggesting that it serves as a barrier for this growing group in the U.S. economy. Overall, licensing and the lack of consistency across state borders with respect to education and training of licensed practitioners can carry broad implications for the economic well-being of individuals. Evidence indicates that licensing influences the allocation of labor in critical areas of the economy, such as health care, construction, and education, and it has an important influence on employment, wage determination, employee benefits, and prices. Some even suggest that licensing dampens the rate of innovation and misallocates resources within an occupation by setting fixed and, in some cases, arbitrary rules. Uh, in terms of suggestions, first, state licensing should require that the federal government I should encourage cost-benefit analysis prior to, to the approval of new licensing standards. Second, licensed individuals should be allowed to move across political jurisdictions with minimal retraining or residency requirements. And third, where feasible, government should reclassify certain licensed occupations to a system of certification or remove regulations on some professions entirely. These proposals should lead to employment growth in affected occupation and a reduction in consumer prices. Replacing licensing with certification in certain occupations, thereby providing more competition, would in most cases result in substantial gains in economic growth and employment without measurable harm to consumers. Great. Thank you, Dr. Kleiner. I'm went to high school in Minnesota, so, and I'm an econ professor for 20 years out here. So I'll start the, I'll yield myself five minutes for a few questions. I, you, you got right to it in your uh, comments, and uh, you're all way too polite. I, I want you to kind of get into what's really going wrong here too, right? So we, in Virginia, we had a guy named Jim Buchanan who won a Nobel Prize in economics for regulatory capture and all this kind of thing, right? So, and you mentioned, I want to hear, I'm going to ask you about uh, the black market if you overregulate, but what I'm interested in any metrics or where you kind of started off with an interesting thing that some of the higher priced industries that have been around have more uh, regulation and cert certification. And so, I mean, are there any other metrics like that? Just real quick off the top of your head that you can think of that. How do you identify, you know, Mr. Zona said <clears throat> he's got 
<clears throat> huge variety even within his in industry uh, on certification. Some it's good, some it's bad. <clears throat> the American people, if you knock doors, politics, door to door and ask people, do you want more or less regulation? I'm stunned. They still say more, right? If you go to small business, they say, oh, <laughs> you know, the opposite, right? They're, so there's this, everybody kind of wants safety, but they don't get, there's $2 trillion in downside, right, from regulation on the economy. And so are there any quick metrics, I, just because we're limited for time, that come to mind? How do you identify the people who are gaming the system versus whether there's a legitimate social, you know, need for some minimal certification? And Dr. Kleiner, we'll start with you. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Chair Brett and uh, Ranking Member Evans. Uh, certainly, there have been estimates. Uh, there was a white paper put out by the, the previous administration which identified many of the costs, both in terms of uh, several over $200 billion in lost output and, in addition, a reallocation of resources from relatively well-off licensed practitioners from consumers. So the thought experiment would be a relatively low, lower wage uh, wait, waiter or waitress having to pay more for dental services. So there's the reallocation as sort of, it's, it's a reverse Robin Hood effect in terms of reallocation of resources from poor consumers to relatively well-off uh, licensed practitioners. Excuse me. There's uh, such a variety of uh, licensed uh, occupations. So uh, I look at mine um, with pride, but really recognizing that it's a, a, the the lower end of of uh, occupations relative to other licensed ones, right? Um, and um, and so I don't know. I don't know on 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 that uh, that upper end. I just know that in in mine um, the 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 issue of worker classification, the, the challenge that I face at, at uh, being increasingly fewer of me that are actually employing their people, um, I don't know how to extrapolate the economics of that, but it's the biggest challenge that I yeah. face. And, and, and in your industry, because sometimes up here in D.C., you got the bigs, right? There's big everything, big airlines, big banks, right. big insurance, big everything. So there, you know, you go, okay, you know, are they regulating to keep out the small guy? In yours, is there... It, it, one thing I haven't heard anyone comment on, it just as bureaucracies form, right? You get fees, you're the director of an association that's going to certify. So your new interest now is to do certification. I mean, so is it bigs uh, putting pressure on certificates or is, is some of this the, just the nature of bureaucracy? Hey, once you start certifying, let's do more, you know, we, we need to add more safety stuff. We need to add more of this. And the harm comes when uh, Mr. Deedley mentions this, this poor woman that has no subsistence. Right. She's got no right. job. And so you always add to regulate. Oh, this is good. You know, the shop should have this, this and this. We've got, you know, kind of a daycare crisis in this country. I looked into that. We, we had churches that are willing to do it, seniors that are willing to watch kids and they can't do it because of the regulation of the building. Right. You got free daycare solution built into the economy sitting there, but you can't do it. And the harm comes to you know, the moms and dads who need some daycare and whatever. No one ever sees the harm, right? That's always the hidden part that's brushed aside. And so, I mean, have you ever seen, or any of you seen, just there's, there's kind of an inherent nature built into bureaucracies themselves that once you start certifying it, you know, they take pride in their industry, but there's a downside. Uh, I'll comment once more quickly and, and, and let others. Um, uh, it's interesting because I, I don't think our industry on the trade association side has really made a significant effort um, to certify. It happens from manufacturers, but it's a very fragmented industry, and maybe many of the ones that uh, licensed are. Um, and, and it's been licensed since, I want to say, the 1920s. So it's been convenient, I suppose the, the word would be, the, for the industry to say that's uh, for, for the state boards to do, right? Um, and uh, so I think this conversation and the pressure, if you will, from, uh, from uh, Congress and, and, and the states, all of this has been healthy. You know, it gets us paying attention and maybe doing more as an industry than uh, we have in the past. Good. And I'm over my time. I'm going to come back to it when I we'll go around. Uh, but uh, right now, I'd like to yield to uh, the ranking member, Mr. Evans, for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hall, um, in, in many instances, professional associations request 
a state legislature to enact licensing regulations? How do we balance the need to ensure quality service while also ensuring competitiveness in the market? Well, and I think that's a great question, and I think that's exactly why we're here. That's the, that's the hard part, because clearly licensing, um, making sure professionals provide adequate services, even above adequate services, for I think that's, that's very important. But when that licensing becomes a barrier to starting your own business or a barrier to, to a new job, I think that's, that's when we have a problem. So I think the first thing to do, how we can implement that, again, is what we're doing today, increase awareness. And I think the FTC's efforts uh, through their task force, I think that's a b good first step to raising awareness. This hearing as well. I think a critical factor is finding some way to have states come together so that there is some ability for reciprocity. I think each of us have talked about being able to move and provide services in other states. While you're at that point, you, you're going to my next point, then how do we encourage states and lo local governments to standardize, standardize where appropriate without tampering their autonomy? You know, obviously we didn't, <laughs> I mean, you know. It's a great, no, great I know question. the chairman don't want the idea of micromanaging Richmond, so the fact of the fact is, well, how do we strike that balance without I think, know, I think we're local in our, and states? I think we're in our 241st consecutive year of arguing over federal government versus state right, government, right, and we right. probably will continue to do right. that. Okay. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, and, and I certainly yield to you guys, this is what this is your expertise, not mine, but using our influence uh, in this committee, in the federal government, back in our constituencies, to let them recognize this is a problem for their industries as well. Uh, we we, we kind of have that human nature thing of we want to control what we have, we want to control our association, our industry, and it's kind of scary to open it up to others when, when the actual fact is the more we open it up, the more everything grows. And I think that communication, uh, that awareness, is the number one thing I believe we can do today to make a difference at the state level. Dr. Clint, your reaction to what I just asked in terms of question from your perspective of that balance of autonomy. Thank you, Member Evans. Uh, I think that uh, I think that uh, these issues are uh, are a continuing issue of tension, and certainly uh, one potential solution might be the Restoring Board Immunity Act, which is a trade-off of allowing board members uh, to be immune from antitrust. Uh, litigation uh, for the states examining very closely the three issues that I mentioned in terms of doing cost-benefit on new occupations becoming regulated, uh, questions of migration, and then looking uh, at issues of reducing regulation and examining, do all these 800-plus occupations that are licensed in at least one state do they all need to be licensed? And certain states, such as Michigan, uh, have chosen to deregulate and move from licensing to certification of many occupations. Colorado has done that. And several governors have taken the lead uh, and have vetoed new occupations that are seeking to become moving from either certification or no regulation to becoming licensed. What was the incentive for those states to take that kind of action? Uh, it's, uh, I think part of it was the governors uh, looking at issues that, that this committee is looking at and saying, do these occupations need to be regulated? Uh, what, are, what have been the effects on small businesses of, of what they would perceive or many small businesses would perceive to be labor shortages in certain areas? Uh, businesses coming to uh, the legislature and saying, well, do we really need to have people uh, do what, what might be considered scope of practice? That is, there are certain jobs that, for example, a plumber or electrician have to be o oversee the work of someone who's actually doing the work. So there's scope of practice issues which are also uh, a, a question, and, and are they creating inefficiencies in the economy? So all these are, are, are issues that have been uh, brought to the states and have led both the legislature 
in some cases, and the governors to, to move in many cases to reduce regulation. Mr. Chairman, why I asked that question, I was a legislator for 36 years, so a little special place in my heart at the state level. So I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. And at this time, I'd like to yield five minutes to Ms. Clark from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, to our ranking member. I also want to thank our panelists for sharing your insights this morning. Professional licensing has existed for almost as long as industry itself. This vital service ensures that consumers are protected from hucksters and receive nothing but the best quality service from qualified professionals in everything from their door repairmen to their hairstylists and barbers. However, as has been stated in the testimony of our expert panelists here this morning, burdensome licensing procedures can also price entrepreneurs out of the market and prevent consumers from having access to the best number of professionals in their area. When this happens, everyone loses. As just one example, a vegetation pesticide applicator in New York State must pay $3,000 and undergo 66 hours of training in order to be licensed, while the same licensed professional in Nevada, Nevada must pay $450 and undergo 16 credit hours of training. It's tough to tell from these facts alone whether $3,000 is too much or $450 is too low. However, the fact remains that this is a huge disparity that is not fully accounted for by the vegetation alone. We must therefore do what we can to ensure that licensing standards are fair and uniform without harming consumers or professionals. So, um, Dr. Kleiner, uh, occupational licensing is primarily a state function. What role, if any, does the federal government have in reforming and or creating a standard uh, for these laws? licensing, uh, and uh, also uh, under the Federal Trade Commission, there can be trade-offs that, uh, that can be granted in terms of reducing regulations on members of the board. For example, right now, many board state board members are concerned or perhaps won't even serve on state boards because they're fearful of being sued uh, under uh, a recent Supreme Court case involving North Carolina Dental uh, versus the Federal Trade Commission, which the Federal Trade Commission won that particular case, and board members are concerned about their service on board. So the trade-off might be immunity from uh, lawsuits uh, and, and reducing uh, burdensome regulations that affect both small businesses and consumers. And Mr. Hall, how can we make it less expensive for entrepreneurs to become licensed? Um, that, that's a great question. I, I think technology over time can help us with that, that process. I think uh, education, training, online access to those materials uh, can help with the overall cost. Uh, for those industries that require travel to a, a local school, if those can then be expanded to online applications, I think that's another way to reduce the cost. Uh, I, I think the more scary thing, again, for me is, is just like your specific example, when you live in one state and you may have a, a barrier to entry of what you choose to spend your life doing of $3,000 and, and 10 weeks of training, you move across the state line and now it only costs you $456, that, that seems to be a disparity that doesn't make sense. So I, I, I certainly believe decreasing the cost is one of the priorities we should manage, especially for those lower income people who are looking for a way to take care of themselves and their families. I think that's very important. But at the same time, finding some way to communicate amongst the states, getting them to communicate amongst one another to find some uniformity and reciprocity that can make the whole process easier. Thank you. 
Mr. Jarrett, in your testimony, you spoke of opportunity hoarding. How can we best create a system of licensing that benefits all? Uh, yeah, that's a, a, a great question. Um, I think uh, it was previously mentioned, um, uh, there's several uh, federal tools, such as the Restoring Board uh, Immunity Act, that uh, would uh, potentially position the federal government to uh, really kind of uh, investigate and uh, incentivize uh, state boards that uh, are mostly comprised of self-interested uh, economic actors to uh, uh, kind of clean up and, and, and re-examine uh, how they operate. And I think that that would go a long way towards getting rid of some of the low-hanging fruit of situations where there is kind of just blatant opportunity hoarding going on. Um, I think in addition to the enforcement uh, efforts that the FTC has, they also have a, an advocacy role, as I mentioned uh, in, in my testimony. And uh, a lot of times uh, when, when licensing laws are proposed at the state level, uh, you know, a lot of state legislators act as part-time institutions, uh, composed sometimes of amateur legislators. And a lot of times the only voice in the room in those situations is... Uh, is, is the industry and the people that want the licensing. And uh, the FTC can, for example, file advocacy comments sometimes at the state level and kind of bring more of a competition market-oriented uh, analysis to it, uh, suggest maybe alternatives to licensing that are not as burdensome but still protect health and safety. Uh, so I, I think that, um, you know, kind of uh, using that uh, uh, advocacy power and enforcement power of the FTC in particular uh, would be a way to uh, uh, address some of the situations where there is just a kind of blatant opportunity hoarding going on. Very well. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Very good. I just wanted to ask a couple more questions, and then if the ranking member has a couple or if anyone else wants to continue. <clears throat> but uh, Dr. Kleiner suggested doing cost-benefit analysis on small businesses and certi certification, whatever. For smaller firms, I love the idea intuitively, but economists, we can make the numbers scream and go our way, and we can torture the data until it says what we like it to say. And so our Catholic brothers and sisters have this thing called the preferential option for the poor. And what that means to me in this context, or could mean, is, I mean, I'd like to hear it. For me, the, the preference or the option should always go to the poor, right? Before you certify and exclude people from a lifetime calling or profession, you better have a real good reason, right, to inhibit someone's liberties, right? So someone's got their talents, it's their passion maybe, they want to go into a livelihood, and then some certification is going to say, you can't do that with your life. Wow. <laughs> I mean, so that, that's kind of interesting. So my own bias is clearly on behalf of the poor and the creativity and the startup there. And so I'm, I'll just ask you, Mr. Dealey, if you can give an example or two of where the poor are getting crushed in terms of opportunity. And if the others want to think of, all right, Brat, you're exaggerating too much. There's some clear cases where you've got to have certification because if you don't, this is what's going to go wrong. So if someone wants to think of it, the counterexample, but if you give us a couple examples that you've run across where uh, someone at the lower end of the income distribution just getting started has just had their life stifled uh, by these regs. Yeah, no, um, I, I like to, uh, I think it's the same thing you're saying, just maybe different words for it, a presumption of liberty, I think, that, you know, the presumption is, is that uh, if it's safe, uh, that you should be able to practice in a certain profession, um, and there's a lot of cases where there isn't that presumption, the presumption runs the opposite way, the presumption runs that, the, that it is totally legitimate to have this license, and of course there's, you know, safety concerns, quality concerns, even if that hasn't been proven, um, and, and that really, you know, actually uh, uh, really bites people at the, at the local level, I mean, uh, uh, anecdotally, if you want, you know, stories, there's uh, stories of the, uh, a lot of um, immigrant uh, communities that practice uh, African natural hair braiding, for example. Uh, they've come to the United States, they want to be able to continue practicing uh, that tradition of theirs and a skill that they know, and several states, Missouri and others, have stopped them from doing that. They've had to shut their businesses. Um, there was uh, uh, a gentleman in uh, tennis. Let's yeah, just go, go through these one by one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So on the hair braiding, does anyone have a compelling reason on the safety side or the reg side, why that person shouldn't be allowed to do that Un with, without a certificate? I mean, is there some compelling 
I mean, it's just interesting to go and then it'll keep going. Sorry to interrupt you, but and then there may be arguments for it. I mean, the, the, a lot of the issue with that, uh, to be fair, is that um, again, it's kind of a scope of licensure issue. They're required to go to cosmetology school, and a lot of those schools don't even teach hair braid natural hair braiding. So you know, maybe you could make an argument that there is some quality safety concern there, but it's not narrowly targeted to actually address that issue. Um, another example is a, a gentleman in uh, uh, Tennessee, actually. Um, Tennessee just passed a law. This is not an old law. It's 2015. Um, and they said that anyone that is a barber in the state had to have a high school education, uh, and this gentleman didn't. Um, I don't know about anyone else in this room. My high school did not teach uh, barbering. That was not a class that uh, was taught. And so it's really, again, totally unclear. You know, maybe, again, yes, there's, there's health and safety concerns there. Maybe you could look at inspections. Maybe you could look at bonding, other alternatives to licensing. Maybe licensing is appropriate, but it certainly seems like the burden of requiring a high school degree in that situation, or like the D, uh, DC did with child care, requiring uh, college degrees now for child care workers in the district, seems that's totally out of proportion to that. And that's actually affecting those people that, again, are you know, usually low-income populations from actually being able to have that presumption of liberty and that presumption that they can work in a field and, and better their lives. Right. And so then it, a, a, a counter case where the certification, there's a clear need or – and Dr. Kleiner, if you want to make a comment. No, my, my, mine was uh, really in terms of what I call scope of practice. So veterinarians – and this is a case that was from the Institute for Justice uh, – precluded individuals who were horse tooth filers from filing the teeth of horses. Uh, they said that only a licensed veterinarian could provide those services. Veterinarians are relatively better paid than uh, individuals who do this manually, yet they, the individuals who did this manually were not allowed because of scope of practice issues mm. and the ability of the veterinary individuals who are in the veterinary board, who are almost all veterinarians, uh, voted uh, and precluded and got in the, uh, the rules and regulations that only veterinarians could deal with the front end of a horse. Anyone can do with the back end. <laughs> that's, good. There's, that's a good one. Uh, ranking members, do you have any closing one last, comments? One, uh, one last question to Frank, if I could. Um, Frank, uh, in your testimony, you stated that other public interest concerns are presented in licensing outside of public safety argument. How can we address these barriers if not through licensing? Um, so trade associations are obviously part of that. It's communication, right? Um, but that is the – when when the chairman said, you know, what is the opposite argument, I, I – coming from the industry, I mean, I totally agree. I don't think the industry was even prepared, as many aren't, when some of these common sense problems come about, like hair braiding, um, uh, shampooing, um, et cetera. So y we've got to figure that out, and I think it is getting figured out. On the other hand, the thing I worry about is information to people, because in, in, in my uh, occupation, for an example, licensing really represents the one point that you certainly have with everyone. So. There was a, a New York Times uh, uh, expose, if you will, uh, on uh, the exploitation of uh, workers in nail salons that was discovered and dealt with to a degree because of licensing. Um, I'm an association person. I'm a joiner. I'm someone who likes to be involved. But the truth of the matter is most people um, are just trying to get through the day if, if they're working and they're in business. I mean, today's payroll. I have my sister doing it, but and I can be here. But most people just aren't going to be joiners. Um, they're... they're you know, I know there's a lot of members, um, but you get my point, is that I do think that the, the, the point of contact uh, is something to really consider. So uh, I don't know if I've answered your question, but I think the industry uh, or profession has to play a bigger role, but I also think that, that we have to be careful about losing a point of contact to um, communicate with people. you back, Bounce. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Well, I'd just like to uh, thank you all very much for coming in, and thank you very much for your testimony. I think the panel uh, worked very well together. I think it was worthwhile, as Mr. Hall said. Uh, part of it's just getting the, getting the conversation going. Uh, you all had great recommendations on steps to put forward. You all put forward very credible evidence in your testimony, and we're gonna, our staffs are going to take that into account and, and move forward and make some progress on this. So thank you very much for uh, being here today, and uh, with that, we'll adjourn. Uh, I better run through the formalities, too. I also ask unanimous consent that members have five legislate, legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record. Without objection, so ordered, this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you all. <laughs>
think your group does great work. Yeah. I think she 